job at the museum uh, for the uh, past many years. You have and your team have been charged with telling the story of the news media and society. We're going to talk today about news media and presidents. Uh, when you think about that relationship uh, from a macro standpoint, what's characterized the relationship between presidents and the press throughout our history? Well, it's an interesting courtship, that relationship between presidents and the press. Um, early on, during the campaign years, of course, the candidates want to woo the press. They want to put on the best face. They know the power of the press to get their message aside. But then when they get in office and the, uh, you know, the, the confetti is down and the celebration is over and the reality of governing um, c- comes in, and they realize that the role of the press is to be a watchdog, to be the people's watchdog on government to see how are they doing the job that they're doing, to be a check and balance on that president. And few presidents enjoy being criticized, and that's often the role of the press. So that relationship for people who don't understand that, um, it can go very badly. If uh, we're going to talk about changing media mm-hmm. over time and also uh, changing reporting styles. So throughout, I mean, when was the tradition begun that the news media should be an impartial judge? Because so much of our history, news reporting was you read the side that you were attuned to. So when did that shift? That's almost the 20th century ideal um, in the early days, like in the George Washington days, the press was highly partisan. Remember, it was the publishers and the printers who make the case for it being time to separate from you know, Great Britain and King George III. Um, it, was, it was highly partisan, highly volatile. I mean, printers were being tarred and feathered, their presses burned. It was a very volatile environment. We talk now about how um, divided we are as a country, you're either an MSNBC person or a Fox News person. But back in the early years of our country, in the first several presidencies, it was very much that way. And really continued even past the Civil War era. Absolutely. Because Lincoln, which we're going to talk about later on, uh, you have to read both sets of newspapers to understand mm-hmm. to what's going on, what's exactly. going on there. Uh, when um, thinking in general about successful presidencies, mm-hmm. is there a correlation between presidents who uh, know how to work the newsmen of the newsmen and women of the time and the ultimate success of their presidencies or how they're viewed in history? Absolutely. I think that uh, presidents who understand the, the going media of their day um, are able to deal with it smoothly, understand the press, make friends with the press. Um, you know, we saw that John F. Kennedy, how he had that very sort of cuddly relationship with members of the press who knew things about his private life that were, per- were perhaps not very flattering and chose to overlook it. Of course, it was a different time then. Um, uh, presidents who understand the role of journalists, who respect them for what they do, who respect the First Amendment. Um, Freedom of the press is part of the First Amendment. We're the only country, the first country, to make that part of our governing laws. So it's very important to our very foundation, our very DNA as a country. So it's the presidents who are not thin-skinned, who understand the role of the press as as being sort of the voice for the people, and um, those who understand the medium of their day and are able to project through that medium. So we're going to dig into history, uh, but not in chronological order. I wanted to start with the Nixon presidency, Mm -hmm. uh, because the relationship between President Nixon and the press seemed strained throughout much of his public life. Mm -hmm. Uh, John Farrell just did a landmark Nixon biography, and if you look in the index, there are 16 citations Mm -hmm. under media's mutual enemy with (laughs) uh, enmity with Nixon, uh, setting the stage for it, uh, uh, what you would learn in the book. During the Cold War era, when he was a senator, he made a name for himself as an anti-communist warrior. Mm-hmm. The media in the 40s and the 50s looked upon Richard Nixon in those days. How and when did it begin to change and become more antagonistic? Well, he certainly makes a national name for himself during the House Un-American Activities Committee hearings where he's pressing people about communists in the government and Alger Hiss. Um, and, of course, that's the height of the Red Scare where people are terrified that there might be communists in our government. In fact, there were communists in our government, and yet the republic still stands. We're still here. Um, then he is on the ticket with um, Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, on his vice presidential ticket, and a report surfaces that um, Mr. Nixon has perhaps taken finances from someone that he should not have done so. And so he goes on television. He's sort of in hot water with Eisenhower as well as his, uh, as well as the country. He goes on television and he gives his famous checker speech. This is probably the height of Nixon's um, success with television. He goes on and and talks about how the only present that he's ever gotten was this dog, Checkers, and both of his girls love Checkers, and we're going to keep him. And so Americans thought, ah, what a good dad he is. And and so, you know, he he becomes vice president. 
Uh, when he and in his presidency, his mistrust of the press of the press is is, is a landmark of, of, of his time in office. Um, after he loses his first run for the presidency, he goes back to California um, and says, and, and, and then loses another race for governor in California. And at a famous press conference, he says, you're not going to have me to kick around anymore to members of the press. So that's, his, that's his attitude, and that's pretty much prevailing. Um, during the White House era, of course, he um, creates an enemies list of, of, of reporters who are friendly, who are not friendly, has the FBI investigating reporters. So um, that poor relationship with the press really never is resurrected. And it certainly did not help him much when two young journalists for The Washington Post dig about on the uh, Watergate break-in, and it goes all the way to the White House, and he resigns his presidency. From those, that unsuccessful California governor's race, from John Farrell's biography, he wrote, writes, rather, the California press corps knew the state and its issues. They believed that Nixon was using the governor's office as a stepping stone and bridled at his haughty expectation <laughs> that they owed him a free pass. They met him with skepticism and sometimes hostility. He returned the favor, labeling them as prostitutes and hatchet men. Tough to get over that, <laughs> that, really, that, that kind of a conversation. How, how, do you, how do you get past that when that's kind of setting the stage for it? And of course, you know, we have the famous uh, Kennedy-Nixon debates when Nixon has just come out of the hospital. He's had an infection. He doesn't look good. Um, the first nationally televised presidential debates, John F. Kennedy, hand, handsome, rested, very at ease in front of the camera, former journalist himself. Um, and the people who listened to that debate on the radio thought that Nixon had more content but the people who saw it on television were mesmerized by the telegenic appeal of John F. Kennedy. Really interesting since you cited two earlier experiences when he seemed to understand the power mm -hmm. of the medium, the televised, uh, the committee hearings, and then also the um, checker speech. Mm -hmm. So was it more the circumstance, do you think, of his illness, or is it not known why he didn't do so well in the Kennedy-Nixon debates? I think people generally feel that it was pretty much that he... Um, he they, I think they asked Kennedy, did he want makeup? He was very tan already. He said, no, I don't. Nixon perhaps felt it was not manly to put makeup on. You know, that was probably a, a, a bad gamble on his part because, of course, makeup helps everybody look better on television, not uses, and you look perfect without makeup. doesn't matter. <laughs> but he, that, was a, that was a decision he made, and, you know, the illness didn't help, and it was just a, a poor performance on television, but, you know, radio, better. Once the Watergate story broke after his, his landslide election, um, when we look at what happened between the White House and how that White House today, uh, in that day, responded to crises versus what we're seeing with the White House today mm -hmm. uh, responding. It was a very different era in the media. What were some of the lessons of the reporting around the time of Watergate and what the media was like then versus today that people might be interested in? Mm -hmm. Well, I think cover-up is always um, a mistake. You know, whenever you're putting so much energy in a cover-up, that's always a bad sign. Um, you know, they really s circled the wagons against the press and the media. Um, the, the, the sort of Saturday Night Massacre events that happened. We're seeing elements of that today with the Trump presidency, these sudden people leaving office, people who have served their governments and, and their country for decades and decades um, as civil servants, as military servants suddenly leaving. Um, those are anomalies that the press is going to cover. Um, when shocking things like that happen, the press has to give people an understanding of what's going on there. We have our first piece of video to share with uh, you and the audience, and this is R Richard Nixon and a post-Watergate story-breaking news conference, November 17th of 1973. Just a little glimpse of how he uh, reacts and interacts with the media. Let's watch. And I want to say this to the television audience. I made my mistakes, but in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. And I think, too, that I can say that in my years of public life, that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president is a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. President. Well, those are words that would go back to haunt him. Um, you know, what, what is the headline that every newspaper editor in the country is going to say, I am not a crook, uh, Richard Nixon. Um, and yet he resigns his office in ignominy. So um, that defensive tactic that you see in him on television does not play well um, on that medium. It just, um, he comes off sounding defensive all the way through. And then when he says, I'm not a crook, the immediate thing that you think is, yeah, you might be.
from the the media side, the whole generation of young people were drawn into the business of journalism mm. after Woodward and Bernstein. Mm-hmm. So how did newspaper reporting and uh, change and coverage of the president change as a result of Watergate? Absolutely. I think that many young journalists um, saw it as a field that would be one where you could do good for society. You could um, unearth conspiracy, um, correct injustice, draw attention to stories that weren't otherwise being told. I think that there were a whole generation of people who went into journalism because of Woodward and Bernstein and the power that they had and the important story that they did. Um, I think that the the relationship, the cozy relationship that the press and presidents had, for example, in the Kennedy years, was no longer. Um, it became much more mistrustful. Of course, that's happening also with the Vietnam War and the Pentagon Papers that reveal that the government has been misleading the American public about how well the war is doing. So many things are happening. It's the counterculture era when young people are challenging the, their elders. Um, we have a, a, a president who has gone down to resignation in Um, in in shame and ignominy, and many things are happening culturally that are leading people to mistrust authority in general, and that attitude um, reverberates in the press. So just eight years earlier in the election that Richard Nixon lost that brought John Kennedy to power, a very different relationship Mm -hmm. between the president and the media. Very much. Uh, The term Camelot often used to refer to the time. What are the things to know about how the press and John Kennedy interacted during his presidency? Well, the things to know are um, John Kennedy and his wife Jacqueline understood the power of image, um, understood the power that their telegenic young family would have on the American public. You know, we come from the Eisenhower years of a much older president and first lady. Suddenly we have this first lady who is like a Hollywood star. She sells magazine covers just by her presence. She's very mysterious and soft-spoken. Um, and those young children in the White House really get... Um, get a generation of Americans excited about, now these, these people are going through the, the same thing that I'm going through, the baby boom generation, are watching these young children grow up in the White House for a few years. Um, Kennedy was very comfortable with the press. He was comfortable with that intellectual debate about ideas and criticisms of himself. Um, and he's, you saw that days after his inauguration, he has the first live presidential press conference. And you see that bantering, that sense of humor that he has. And he charmed the American public and he charmed the press. They admit later they did not hold him to the same standards that they might have were he not such a personally engaging person. He had a great friend in Ben Bradley, um, who was with Newsweek and then the famous editor at the Washington Post. And those kind of connections um, helped pave him his way in the Washington power structure. One last citation from John Farrell on this. He wrote, Kennedy could curse the press, Mm -hmm. tap their phones, keep his private blacklist, and piteously crush a foe. But with the confidence bestowed by wealth, good looks, and breeding, he didn't let the censure get to him. The storms passed and the tempests eased by irony or humor. Nixon didn't have that quality. So is it uh, somewhat about personality and the relationship with the press? It's absolutely about personality. I think, you know, you see that in, you know, President Trump has been elected. Um, He's a a reality television star. Um, His personality is one that resonates with a large percent of the American population. Um, I think personality is really critical, and I think the presidents who understand the best way to get their personality across through the prevailing media of the day um, are often the most successful. Well, we're going to go back farther in time in history, but before we do, a little bit about you so people know who they're listening to. What is your job at the museum? I am the vice president of content and exhibits. I have this wonderful job where we tell stories about um, the five freedoms of the First Amendment and how ordinary Americans can use them to affect change from the civil rights era to the LGBTQ era. Um, I have a great job. How long has the museum been open? The museum's been open for um, almost 22 years, first in Roslyn, and now we've been on Pennsylvania Avenue for about 12 years. And sadly, we are gonna close our location on December 31st to the public and go off into a new future and figure out how we're gonna do our mission into the future because our mission has never been more important to explain to people the five freedoms of the First Amendment, particularly the role of the freedom of the press, Um, So that's what we're going off to, that future. The museum is uh, funded by uh, admission fees, and Mm -hmm. how else? Um, Funded by admission fees. Our primary funder is the Freedom Forum. That's our our parent organization. We also have um, donors um, uh, who who have helped sustain us throughout the years, um, and ticket prices for the people who have come and seen us. So it's, uh, I'm sure many people watching have made it part of their Washington, D.C. visits when they come to the nation's capital. Do you have plans now for where all the exhibits might be going? 
We have a robust traveling exhibit schedule. Um, Rise Up, uh, Stonewall, and the LGBTQ rights movement is going to travel to Seattle, the Museum of Pop Culture, next June. Um, we've also got a Pulitzer Prize exhibit on the road, uh, 40 Chances about the power of photography to uncover the causes of hunger from um, photographer Howard Buffett. So we've got a lot of exhibits on the road, and we're going to continue doing our programs and our um, robust um, work around the Journalist Memorial, where we highlight um, journalists who've given their all, given their lives, uh, to report the truth to people around the world. You came to this job as a reporter and editor. Uh, tell me about your journalism career. Oh, sure. I, um, my first job was at a small newspaper for the Gannett chain in uh, Huntington, West Virginia, the Huntington Advertiser. That folded shortly after I got there, and I went to the morning paper, the, the um, Herald Dispatch, and I worked there for three years. And then I came to USA Today as a, one of the founding editors, which was really exciting. It was a startup. No one knew anything about us, and then it became the largest national newspaper in the country. So that was a really exciting ride to have. What took you into journalism in the first place? A little bit of Woodward Mernstein. <laughs> a little bit of that um, passion in the 70s to see, you know, how do, how do you combine skills writing and telling stories with a desire to um, make the world a better place. And if you look at the world of journalism from when you started or even when USA Today began, uh, what are the differences uh, today and in, in those earlier years? Gosh, um, I, wish, I wish I could be more optimistic, but there were many more journalists in the 1970s than there are right now. Um, the losses that um, mainstream print publications have had to the digital news era have been decimating particularly to local journalism. Um, there are places where there are news deserts, where there is no news organization, news outlet covering the news for large swaths of the American people. Um, that's very troubling. Um, we've seen the rise of digital media and the rise of social media, and some people see things on Facebook and see it as fact when it's not reported, like journalists do fact-checking and calling multiple sources. There really aren't two sides to any story. There are multiple sides to a story. So. Um, there are some troubling things that are happening. I like to be an optimist. I would like to think that the American people are going to see that members of the press are critical to our democracy and will start supporting media, whether it's print or podcasts, but um, get your news from, from good sources because the truth matters. Uh, in September, the Pew Organization did uh, one of its regular surveys on public attitudes, mm -hmm. and at that time they reported that only 41% of the public that they surveyed saw the news uh, media as fair arbiters, honest, honest brokers of what's mm -hmm. going on. And if you look to the next level, a big partisan divide, mm -hmm. uh, much more trusted by Democrats than Republicans. What's going on there, do you think? Well, um, we actually do a survey, the, the Freedom Forum does an annual survey, the State of the First Amendment. And actually, our numbers are a little bit better than that. People are feeling a little bit better about the press. Um, I would say it has to do with um, the your, your political point of view, um, the internet and digital media has allowed us to stay in digital bubbles of our own thought. Um, we, we can go to a place where we can only see red state news or only see blue state news. It just reinforces your ideas about the world and the government and the role of the press. Um, I think the press um, missed a big story in 2016 when Donald Trump was elected. Much of the mainstream media poo-pooed that possibility, said that Hillary Clinton was you know, the only person who was going to win. Um, so I think that hurts as well. And I think um, perhaps uh, the news media needed to do some soul searching after that. How can we better serve the public? How can we better do the job that we are here to do? So we're going to continue our history lesson and we're going to go back to the very founding. Uh, George Washington, the mm -hmm. only president elected unanimously. How long was his honeymoon? Um, not very long, sadly. Um, you know, George Washington um, first uh, comes to the press. He's, you know, he's a landowner. He uses newspapers to advertise for uh, runaway slaves and things like that. So he's a person of that era. Um, as a general, he is a bit critical of the press because he sees the press as revealing the location of the enemy too often. Nonetheless, he's reading the Loyalist papers. That's the loyal to the crown, of course, to find out movements of the British army. Um, and he is heroic. He's the father of the country. So when he comes into office, and again, this highly partisan press starts sniping at him, accusing him of all sorts of malfeasance, he is taken aback by it. He's quite thin-skinned about it, and he's taken aback by it, and he does not appreciate it. Um, of course, later in life, he's the father of our country. His reputation um, you know, stands the test of time. But while he's in office, he does not appreciate the criticism about him that this highly partisan press are saying really horrible things about him. Um, tough, to, tough to read. The historians at Mount Vernon have this interesting statistic 
They write that the popular press exploded from under 50 newspapers around 1776 to over 250 by 1800, encouraged by new federal laws that made it cheaper to send newspapers through the postal system. Absolutely. So, so the politicians, although they're unhappy with the coverage, still enabled the growth of the, the news media during that era. Right. And even and, you know, he subscribed to 30, 30 plus newspapers. He's a voracious reader of the, of the press. And despite, um, I guess, his uh, smarting at the criticism that he received at the hands of the press, um, on the night before he died, his, his biographer talked about he was sitting there reading the paper, discussing the news of the day, understand the important role of the press to inform the American public about critical events. Historian Ron Chernow of Hamilton fame was asked to speak to the White House Correspondents Association dinner in April of 2019. Uh, he used it to give a history lesson about the relationship between presidents and the press. We have a clip of what he said about George Washington. Let's listen. Washington became the victim of the most preposterous slander when the opposition press charged that he'd been a secret British agent throughout the Revolutionary War. Obviously, the British had gotten a very poor return on their investment. <laughs> now, some of the most blistering attacks against Washington came from an unexpected source. His Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, had hired a poet named Philip Freneau as State Department translator. In truth, Jefferson had recruited him to found a party organ called the National Gazette that would publish slashing broadsides against the very president that Jefferson served. Freneau performed his task with such malicious gusto that he used to drop off copies of his incendiary paper on Washington's doorstep every day. Now, it's hard to convey the anguish that seized Washington's mind as he reeled from press criticism. Any additional comments about George Washington after watching that? Just that he does understand the power of the press to move people. Um, during a dark moment in the Revolutionary War, he has his generals gathered to read to the troops um, Thomas Paine's crisis. Um, he's the famous pamphleteer who says, "'Tis time to part," and reading quotes from that in the dark of the night in a terrible moment in the war when things are cold and there's not much food. And it's, he's trying to rally the troops with the words of why we need to do this. These are the times that try men's souls. So imagine how moving that would have been and how powerfully George Washington must have thought about the people who are writing these words that were inspiring this new nation to be birthed. Did his successor have the same powerful feelings about the, the role of the press in society, John Adams? <laughs> Well, um, John Adams also does not appreciate being criticized by the press. And during John Adams' administration, we have the Alien and Sedition Acts. Um, at that point, we're kind of on the verge of war with France. And so these acts are passed, one of which makes it illegal to criticize the president or the Congress. Um, they're seeing this is, this is a way that the government is saying, we don't want anyone to be, um, to be undermining our government at this time when we're, at the, we're possibly at the verge of war. And that act, the passage of that act... Um, it's just a few years after the First Amendment has been passed, this first test of this First Amendment freedom, freedom of the press, leads to Adams being uh, a, a one-term president and leads to Thomas Jefferson being elected because people did not like the idea of their, the freedom of press, which they did not have under the, uh, under the king, being undermined in any way. Let's return to Ron Chernow for just a minute. During the administration of John Adams, the country lurched into a period of reaction amid a war scare with France and rapid, rampant fear of foreigners. Congress enacted the infamous Alien and Sedition Acts, which made it a crime for journalists to write about the president in a scandalous or malicious fashion. At this dark moment, Jefferson, with his serene faith in the people, prophesied, quote, with a little patience, we shall see the reign of witches past their spells dissolve. Let it be noted that because of his anti-press record, John Adams not only lost his re-election campaign in 1800, but his Jeffersonian opponents reigned supreme for the next quarter century. However, we heard that Thomas Jefferson was not above using uh, reporting to go after Washington's policies. And he also had some difficulties himself with reporting about his own public uh, private life during his administration. So what are the lessons of Thomas Jefferson? Well, Thomas Jefferson is an idealist, of course. Um, you know, he, the famous quote about, you know, we are given the choice of a, uh, a government with no newspapers or newspapers with no government. I would not hesitate to choose the latter. So he, that quote is often used as he is such a champion 
of the First Amendment and freedom of the press. But again, once you're in office and the, the long knives come out, and again, very highly partisan press, the, the Republicans versus the Federalists, that, that debate goes on. And this, the scurrilous charges that those newspapers are throwing at um, politicians at the time would really shock people today, the, the language that was used and the things that were said. Um, he did not appreciate that. Um, so while he likes the ideal of the First Amendment and freedom of the press, he wants the press to be available to all. He wants everyone to be literate. Everyone's not literate at this time, nor are they today, for that matter. So he wants people to have access to the press. He wants the press to be literate. And he also, even though he's a champion of the First Amendment, he also thinks that perhaps the states can you know, deal with the, uh, the issues of libel and, uh, and press freedom on that. So he doesn't see the dichotomy of that idea that, yes, we're for freedom of the press in its glorious uh, openness, and yet perhaps there might be some ways that the uh, states themselves can limit it somewhat. We're going to fast forward to Abraham Lincoln, the mm. president facing probably the greatest test of any mm. president in the Civil War. Um, you uh, have described his relationship with the press as complicated. Why? Complicated? Well, he comes into office at the time that two incredible um, innovations are happening with mass media. One is the rise of photography, and the other is the telegraph, the transcontinental telegraph. So people can get news more quickly than they have before. You know, this works out well for his generals um, during the Civil War. Uh, it also works out well for the American people who are getting news of the war and how the war is going much more quickly than they had before. And also photography. Um, although newspapers at the time did not have the technical capabilities to publish photography in newspapers, there were galleries on Pennsylvania Avenue of Matthew Brady's photographs. Um, famously, Lincoln gives a speech at Cooper Union in New York. Matthew Brady takes a photograph of that. It's later replicated in wood carvings in newspapers like Harper's Weekly. And Abraham Lincoln gives credit. He said it was Matthew Brady in the Cooper Union speech that made me the president today. It's that power of image that people relate to, to understand you, to see you as a person and to understand you. And Lincoln was adept at that. How about by the time the, the war was really raging and there were partisan newspapers on both sides, um, how, how did, in fact, he react to the coverage of the news about him? Um, what, what should we learn about his uh, time dealing with reporters under crisis? Well, um, he uh, is known to sort of have, have hung out at a telegraph office and, and, and hung out with journalists. He invited journalists to the White House. Um, but when the war is getting to its intense points, um, his uh, Secretary of War, uh, Secretary Stanton, uh, has no problem um, dismissing certain journalists who are not reporting the news the way they want it to be. He limits access to the telegraphs, which, of course, is going to kill a reporter who's trying to get the news more quickly to his readership. Um, journalists are uh, arrested and charged with various uh, treason and other things at the time. And Lincoln kind of looks the other way. So he always tops surveys as uh, the, our greatest leader among presidents. Mm -hmm. With that sort of record and the restriction of rights of the media, why do you think people have forgiven him that uh, and, and processed that and still put him at the top of the list? Those are some pretty serious reactions to the coverage. They are. But, you know, I think that we found, like, in, after 9-11, um, people were giving, willing to give up, you know, their, their First Amendment freedoms in the case of security. And I think presidents play off that. Um, sometimes to a too extreme degree of the threats that um, the free flow of information to the American people um, can have. We have an image from uh, the Library of Congress just to give a little flavor of some of the criticism mm -hmm. that Abraham Lincoln uh, faced. I'm going to explain this because people won't be able to quite see it on uh, close up, but it is a cartoon and it's a depiction of Columbia, the United States, who is confronting President Lincoln and says, Mr. Lincoln, give me back my 500,000 sons. At the right, the cartoonist sits with a proclamation call calling for 500,000 more troops signed by him. And his reply is, well, the fact is, by the way, that reminds me of a story. Uh, the archivists tell us that that's referring to false reports published by the New York World that Lincoln would have joked on the battlefield at Antietam. So a critical press and a mm. uh, president under siege, uh, both politically and uh, with the media around him. Um, as we close on the Lincoln era, what was changing with the news media? You, the, there's the telegraph, mm -hmm. photography. They were partisan. Are we about to enter a new age of reporting as we leave the Civil War era and come into a more stable time? Mm, not quite yet. <laughs> getting, getting a little bit better. I mean, he's being criticized by both the northern and the southern press. Um, 
publishers from all sides are going after Lincoln. And um, that's probably just the nature of war and a, a, a time that is renting our country apart, somewhat similar to what's happening today. Um, very few people are, are, are pleased when hundreds of thousands of uh, young men are losing their lives to a battle that some feel was not necessary. Of course, we now know that that was a, a transform, f- formational moment in our nation's history, and that is why Lincoln, um, more books have been written about him than any other president, and he is still seen as incredibly heroic for getting the country through that horrific period. As we start to progress through the later uh, part of the 19th century, mm-hmm. we start to hear the biggest names in the in newspaper world and newspaper history, Pulitzer, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's happening to the American consumption of the newspapers as the, in the latter part of that century and the people who publish them? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Joseph Pulitzer is a good example. Um, the New York Sun. Uh, the mass media is really happening now. You know, the penny press. So um, more newspapers are being published. More people are having access to them. There are the newspaper wars between Pulitzer and Hearst. They're trying for provocative coverage. Pulitzer is very um, uh, has has done a lot of things to really push news coverage forward. Um, he understands the power of uh, the type of coverage that you know women's coverage. Um, it, making newspapers more accessible to the common man. Not everyone is highly educated at this time. So the fact that he's moving the ball forward and making the media more open to the public um, is really a huge moment. By the time Theodore Roosevelt comes into office at the dawn of the 20th century, mm-hmm. big changes with uh, how he treats the press. Tell me about some of them. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, is very big personality. Um, he understands the power of the press to help get his... Uh, image and ideas across. Um, he makes friends with the press if they're friendly with him, makes them feel like they're part of his work. You know, he brings the press into the White House very close to his office. So that's there's that intimacy that people feel that, you know, when he's sitting down with members of the press and saying, well, I'm going to tell you this, but just put this on high level sources or an anonymous source. So it makes uh, the reporters feel like they're in on the story and makes them feel like they're part of the presidency, which is a really kind of tricky place for journalists to be. Um, but he is very much aware. He's very, the power of the soundbite, the power of image. He does things that um, make news. Um, he goes down in a submarine in Long Island Sound. He rides on horseback for 98 miles to prove to the press that he is as robust as the uh, military standards would have uh, soldiers be. So these are all incredible moments that the press, which is looking to grab the public's interest with things that are other than sort of drony zoning board reports, Everybody loves to see a president in a submarine. That's kind of a fun story. So he understands that power. Um, you know, his sound bites like speak softly and carry a big stick or my hat's in the ring. Um, the early sound bite. These are the things that really capture the American public, that plain speaking style. Um, and his image is really a powerful part of his presidency. Interesting things from his presidency. He is credited with establishing <clears throat> press relations as an official function at mm-hmm. the White House. He established the first press room at the Mm -hmm. White House and elevated the press secretary to the level of cabinet position. Mm -hmm. So now he's understanding this is this is going to be important to my life. Um, I need to have the members of the press on my side to sell my programs, to sell me as a president. And he clearly understood that. On the other hand, it was the age of the progressive journalists, Mm -hmm. uh, Ida Tarbell, Lincoln Steffens, Upton Sinclair. They would not always buy into the Roosevelt programs or to the majority storyline at the time. So how did he react to those folks? Well, um, in in his uh, lovely turn of phrase, he he labels them muckrakers, people who are willing to dig up dirt but not offer solutions to it. So that's really casting a a negative uh, brush against people who are really doing very significant journalism about the ills in our country, um, about, you know, lynching and uh, corporations that are doing things that are hurting people. Um, he just says, well, they're not offering any solutions, which is really quite quite painful for the important work that was being done at that time. The term muckraker stays with us today. It does indeed. Uh, what it does, does it mean today? I think today it's kind of a badge of courage. I think it's a, a moment of pride. You're muckraker. You're, you're, you're bringing up stories that people don't want to be seen, shining a light on places that are dark and shouldn't be. Well, let's move along again in history, and we're mm-hmm. going to head to the FDR era. Mm-hmm. Uh, not uh, really too many years, but the world is changing by the mm-hmm. time uh, FDR and Eleanor come along. Um, in in uh, our conversations before, you said that you think that uh, FDR perhaps had the best press relations during the 20th century presidents. Why is that? I think he understood the press. Um, I think he also um, understood the importance of the time that he was living in. 
and the moment that he was trying to get across the American people. He, um, he used the fireside chats um, and people felt like he was talking to them directly. My friends, he would say, and people would be leaning into the radio. You see those wonderful photographs. Um, he considered himself a bit of a writer himself. Of course, Eleanor Roosevelt had her radio program and wrote magazine columns as well. Um, so they're, again, they have a real understanding of the power of radio and newspapers to get their message across to people. Um, he made his voice the voice that everyone would trust during the times of the Great Depression, during the World War. That unity of message and the unity of the voice um, really helped get Americans through two major crises of our history um, in a way that came out in a positive way. He, uh, interestingly enough, was not often, um, you know, newspaper publishers are often Republicans, did not like all of the changes that he was having because they meant business sacrifices had to be made. So even though newspapers were not often um, behind him, supporting his candidacy, the American people saw through that, saw what he was doing, and those very practiced radio side chats, he would rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and hone it so that the message would get across in exactly the way that he wanted it to be across. Um, really a powerful, powerful statement. The press, again, is being very respectful of him. Um, he contracted polio, and as a result, he could not walk unaided. But um, there was just a general rule that it was verboten to show him using crutches, even though he would sort of joke about it. And on the rare occasions when newspapers or magazines would show an image of him or mention his legs were useless, um, the American people would write back and say, don't say that about our president. And Interestingly enough, the magazines and publications kind of backed off on that. So interesting where the American public is um, drawing a line in the sand of what they expect out of their press at that moment. And if you had to characterize the, the majority attitude of the reporters covering the White House at that time, were they critical of his policies or, in fact, most, we were talking about image, mm -hmm. polio and the like, but on a policy standpoint, were they critical or mostly supportive of what the president was trying to do? I think mostly supportive, but there are some things that he couldn't get through. Even all of his charm initiatives couldn't get through, but uh, mostly supportive. Before we leave that era, we should have a note about Eleanor Roosevelt mm -hmm. and her uh, contributions to the evolution of reporting. Mm -hmm. uh, she actually uh, had press conferences as first lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing is that she insisted that women reporters cover her uh, as she uh, progressed through the White House years. How important was that in the evolution of journalism? Oh, absolutely critical. I mean, um, you know, when you think about, I mean, thank you, Eleanor. Um, you know, long overdue, um, it was very rare that there were uh, women journalists at the time. And, and that making that statement was, was a crucial one. Um, of course, it's several years after that before women are more widely seen in newsrooms, like in the 1970s is really when that happens, as well as people of color. So putting that line in the sand is an important one to get careers started, to get people thinking that women have a role in this industry as every industry. I'm going to jump from the 40s to the 1960s and early 1960s, and Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. um, comes into the office under the worst of circumstances, mm -hmm. the assassination of John Kennedy. Uh, did he have a honeymoon then as president after that? He did. And he, again, very much understood the power of image. And that famous photo when he is being sworn in on Air Force One, he makes sure that the newly widowed Jacqueline Kennedy is seen in that image. And what a horrific request that must have been of, of him to make of her at that horrible moment in her life to appear in a photograph, not just to send to the American people, but to send to the world. This government will continue. There's continuity. There's no coup. I am in charge. This torch has been passed. This dreadful torch has been passed. Um, he goes into a series of legislative successes, landmark civil rights um, legislation is passed, much on the glow of the Kennedy presidency and wanting to see many of Kennedy's uh, ideas put forth into action. But then, uh, as happens with many presidents, the, the Vietnam War uh, leads to his denouement. How important is it, or what, what part of the story would it be that the Johnsons themselves had built mm. their own media empire? Mm, very important to his career. Um, you know, in Texas, that uh, Lady Bird Johnson um, purchased a radio station, and then they had newspapers, and so that really helped him on his rise in Texas. And um, LBJ, you know, we've all seen those photographs of LBJ corralling legislatures with the finger pointing in that very intimidating style, and that was pretty much his style with the press as well. Um, he felt like you were either for him or against him, 
and um, he was not uh, below or uh, calling your boss if the boss was the president of the network if a story that you had done did not please him. So he's trying to work both sides of it, trying to um, be friends with reporters as well as the powerful moguls who run the various broadcasting companies and newspapers at the time. But you can see where that doesn't play very well if you're a reporter on the beat that he's going to call uh, Fred Friendly at CBS if you do a story that displeases him, which he did to Morley Safer when Morley Safer did a famous report out of Vietnam that showed Marines using lighters to torch um, civilian villages. Um, of course, there are m- multiple sides to that story. That those televised images being seen uh, on the evening news horrified Americans as well as LBJ. And he called the head of the network to complain about it. At this point in time, the three network newscasts really were dominant in society. Mm-hmm. So uh, would you talk a little bit about how people were consuming news and how presidents uh, managed to, to use that, uh, do- that consumption of everyone tuning in at the same time at night to watch news uh, to their benefit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, th- the three evening network news shows were, that was the way that most people got their news, and re- really it still is the way that most people get their news. Broadcast news is, is being rivaled by the Internet, but it's still the way that most people get their news. Um, so those are very powerful. Those three gentlemen who are sending the news to everybody each night are very powerful forces. Um, at a moment in the Vietnam War when Walter Cronkite goes to Vietnam and comes back and he says, it appears that the Vietnam War is going to be a stalemate. When LBJ sees that, he says, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the American public. So that he knows the power that Walter Cronkite making a statement on the evening news that most people are tuning in to for their information is a critical moment in his presidency. We have uh, one of those famous Lyndon Johnson phone calls. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is in 1968 to just serve as an example of the, that relationship that you talked about, about not being afraid to pick up the phone and, and express his anger about things. Let's listen. Frank, I wanted to tell you, I I hang my head in shame at the industry, and particularly at Cronkite and uh, the, what I would say, uh, very unfair, personalized uh, reporting of of these fellows, and I think that you you ought to know that opinion because you're going to be disappointed in me down the road if I didn't tell you that. I'm just telling you frankly that I think your industry is wrecking all of us. Reaction? Well, um, that's pretty heavy-handed. And, and you can imagine what it was like for the journalist the next day. I'm sure he's not going to call in the journalist the next day that so offended him in the press conference. Um, and the fact that they're wrecking the country. Very disturbing. Very disturbing. And we're hearing that today. And that there are the, the press is the enemy of the American people, according to President Trump. You know, The press is not the enemy of the American people. The press is out there doing work for the American people, trying to inform on people in power. You know, is your uh, local school board spending money the way it should be? Are students being educated? You know, how is the government working? How should it be working? Are children being kept in cages? These are stories that are important and critical to us. And the fact that presidents question the patriotism of reporters who are trying to do their job and trying to report the news to the American public is very troubling. During the Vietnam War, the Pentagon regularly held press conferences uh, that gave out figures that were inaccurate mm-hmm. about the number of casualties happening in Vietnam, uh, helping to, uh, hoping, I think, to um, keep a public opinion that, uh, at the war, about the war at bay. What did that do to the skepticism of journalists? We talked earlier about the impact mm-hmm. of Watergate, but uh, what was the effect of the Vietnam era as reporters were sitting through these press conferences and then finding out the numbers weren't jiving with what was really happening on the ground? Well, it does lead to a major mistrust. I mean, you know, they, they talked about a credibility gap that LBJ had um, with the American people and with the press. And that phrase would really come to haunt him. Um, and again, we see the things that are happening in society, the changes with the counterculture, People no longer trusting the government. They've lied to us about the Vietnam War. 55,000 people are dead in this country alone because of that. And they have lied to us about this. And, of course, the television news showing images of the war, showing them as quick. I mean, there were other images of the Korean War was on television a bit. But each week, that drumbeat of these are the number of casualties in Vietnam, it takes its toll on the American public. And the images that they see and the fact that it's not going well and that they don't understand why we're there in the first place leads to LBJ deciding he's not going to run for re-election. Let's uh, move to a more current time. Earlier you made reference to presidents uh, or the public in the wartime being willing to give up some of their rights, mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, especially <clears throat> free speech. 
Would you talk about the aftermath of 9-11 mm -hmm. and really what happened um, in this country with the, the American public and their willingness to trade some of their rights for security, especially with the relationship between the press and the president? Well, I would say um, you saw people <laughs> lashing out at people who questioned in any way um, the war effort or the aftermath of 9-11, um, who, people who were questioning, were we going after the right people? Um, people were being seen as, patri as, as not being patriotic, and the American people didn't like that. They felt that, that we, should be, we should be monolithically behind whatever the president says we should be doing, and that's not the role of the press. Once again, it's the role of the press to question authority. Are we doing the right thing? And, of course, in the aftermath, we found out that, you know, wars were waged for really no connection to 9-11 um, at all. By 2008, President Obama was coming into office. Mm -hmm. uh, the wars were still going on, mm -hmm. but at the same time, we have a historic election with America's first African-American president. Mm -hmm. uh, would, what happened in the relationship between the Obama White House and the press as he came into office? What was it like? Well, um, I think the press was well aware of the historic nature of his presidency. And um, Obama it was not the first president or presidential candidate to use the power of social media, but he certainly did it very skillfully, um, you know, with targeted emails and targeted radio reports to people and popular culture. I mean, you know, his um, Yes, We Can, Will I Am of the Black Eyed Peas makes a powerful video that's seen millions of times by people of pop culture figures sort of weighing in on the Obama presidency. Oprah Winfrey, before he's even thrown his hat in the ring, says, put your money behind Barack Obama. So um, the historic nature of his presidency, the fact that this was a moment in this nation's history that many people had long longed for, leads to a bit of a long honeymoon. But then when he clashes with uh, Congress and when uh, his campaign promises aren't always able to be realized, things change. Um, he's also a president who understands the medium of his time. He's the first sitting president to go on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, which is a late night satirical news program that captured the attention of a lot of young people in that time. Um, he goes on between two ferns with Zach Galifianakis, which is kind of a crazy comedy show. But he understands the power of these people, these forces in popular culture to get a message to people um, that he might not otherwise be reaching. However, uh, there were some times during his administration when he cracked down on whistleblowers. Um, the administration actually monitored phone records mm -hmm. and subpoenaed reporters, most notably the James uh, Risen case mm -hmm. uh, from the New York Times. So how do we put all of that into sort of understanding of how this administration approached its relations with the media? Control of in image. I think it all comes down to that. That's what all presidents want to do. They want to control the image. Um, and he did not like the idea that people were leaking bits of information or trying to get information that he did not want to be made public. So uh, Barack Obama is not exactly a First Amendment champion. Um, he, uh, up until this time, he has prosecuted more uh, journalists and whistleblowers than any other presidency in history. How have you told his story at the museum? Um, we've had photo exhibits about President Obama. We've done a couple of exhibits every four years, campaigns in the press. Um, and so we talk about, you know, his incredible social media clout. Um, but again, in the social media clout that using it for yourself, uh, social media also bites back in that there were journalists who captured, uh, shall we say, unscripted moments of him on the campaign trail that ended up reverberating in the media as not being very flattering. Things that he said, the famous thing about people hiding behind their guns, guns and religion in Pennsylvania. Um, these were sort of dings in the long history of his two uh, terms in office, but nonetheless, um, access to the, the, the incredible access that social media lends to everyone in the world means that uh, people have access to the moments that you wouldn't like them to have access to as well. So throughout history, every, you've told us with each successive change in technology, a president has tried to harness that mm -hmm. effectively mm -hmm. uh, to put their own story forward. So now that we come to the 2016 election and the real rise of social media, mm -hmm. and then we have a president elected who is, uh, is the first president with his own Twitter account mm -hmm. that he uses all the time by mm -hmm. himself. What has been the effect of having a president with direct access to the public, really bypassing the traditional media to speak directly to the, to the public and especially his supporters? Well, it's been a powerful, powerful um, tool that the president has. Um, the fact that he does not have to go through any um, gatekeepers or people are saying, oh, wait a minute, that's not exactly true. Um, is a very powerful force. He just has this 
dozens of millions of followers who are reading exactly what he wants them to say. And there's no questioning it. There's no second guessing. It's just this is what the truth is, according to me. Um, so that's a very a big threat to the press and the role that the press has, has traditionally played as gatekeepers to news and information. So it's something it's a time period that the news industry is uh, struggling with itself. How do we how do we counter that? How do we counter someone who goes and spews forth on his social media channels um, uh, information that we know is not true? How do you counter that? And I think the press is still struggling with the best way to do that. So at the same time, he's speaking directly to mm-hmm. the public through his Twitter account. He also regularly criticizes in very strong terms he the does. news media. I think we have one final clip that we want to show, which was uh, his criticizing of the New York Times mm-hmm. um, for their coverage. Let's watch and then we'll wrap this all up. But I came from Jamaica, Queens, Jamaica States. I became president of the United States. I'm sort of entitled to a great story from my, just one, from my newspaper. I mean, you know. And he just wanted his hometown paper to write one positive story about him. He just wants Um, the Times to say something nice about him. That's what he said. I'm sort of entitled to one good story in the New York Times. I started off, I ran against very smart people. And a lot of them. And he said it a few times. Hmm. I, I just sort of think I'm entitled to a great story from the New York Times. I mean, I've done something that nobody's ever done. This was a podcast that the New York Times created after their Oval Office exchange with the president about his coverage. What do you hear in the president's voice there? <laughs> uh, it's a little it's a little sad. I'm, I'm entitled to something nice from my hometown paper. You see that validation that he wants from the New York Times, which, of course, he calls the failing New York Times now because they have not... Uh, given him that sort of puffball of a story that he wanted in the presidency. But again, he wasn't elected king. He was elected president of the United States, and presidents have checks and balances on them, you know, the people's right to free speech and the power of assembly and protest. And certainly President Trump, like all presidents, have endured those First Amendment freedoms. It's not always pleasant to be on the other end of that, but um, in fact, it's the role of the press to be challenging, to be critical, to question things for the American people, because that's what the role of the press is. So let's bring it all the way back and uh, put a a ribbon around this conversation today. So when we look back across uh, our entire history Mm -hmm. of relationships between the presidents and the reporters, journalists covering him, sometimes uh, hack newspapers, depending upon the era Mm -hmm. that we were in, uh, what are the important takeaways that people should have about this relationship, how it's worked, and how it's benefited society? Well, I think the um, important part would be for the presidents to respect the role of the press and its importance in society and to respect the fact that they're going to get criticism at some point and perhaps learn from that criticism. I think it's important. I think it's important for presidents to understand the power of media. And of course, they certainly do. We've got Michael Bloomberg, who just threw his hat in the ring, and he's got a powerful global news network. That's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out. Um, The press plays a critical role in our democracy that's why the Founding Fathers made it the First Amendment of the Constitution, that the press, the power of the press will not be, Congress will not change that power of the freedom of the press. Um, so I think it's important that presidents remember that and uh, respect the role of the press. And I think that by that mutual respect comes across in the information that people get in order to make important decisions about their life and their country. Patty Rule, you've spent uh, the last decade and a half helping people understand how the news media works. Thank you so much for spending an hour with us and helping us understand more about the evolution of the relationship between presidents and the journalists who cover them. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate it. All Q&A programs are available on our website or as a podcast at cspan.org.